glad to have you here this morning. Um, I know we've got quite a few people out sick today because it's going around. I mean, schools were canceled, went on spring break early. I know that didn't hurt some of y'all's feelings. Um, but uh, we're going to have, a, uh, we're gonna have a, a good time this morning. We're going to study uh, the Word of God, and we're going to be able to, to take it and try to apply it to our life. And um, we're going to open with a word of prayer. And if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. We, uh, we appreciate it. And uh, if there's any questions, you can see us after service. We'll be happy to talk to you and, 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 and uh, just answer any questions that you have. But we're going to open with prayer. Then we're going to sing our uh, first hymn, hymn number 544, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. And uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain that we've had this week. Lord, the moisture, and Lord, we thank you for um, just, just being able to be here, Lord, to, uh, to study your word, to, to hear it, Lord, to apply it to our life, Lord, that, you know, we, we do lift up those that are sick and, and not able to be here this morning, Lord, to those that are watching online, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would touch us today, that the word of God would dwell richly within us, Lord, that uh, we would just worship you for, for what you are and who you are. Lord, because you are, are deserving of every bit of our worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that a light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in his Lord delight who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, child and forever I am. Please be seated. Dear Heavenly Father, we do, uh, Lord, we thank you for the good reports that we've had this week. Lord, of you working in, in lives, Lord, to, to heal. Lord, with Tom and, and Lord, with Kathy and Lord, with um, Diane's a daughter, Lord, just to, to hear how you still work in each situation. And Lord, we give you the honor and the glory for it. And so Lord, we do lift up the, the others that are mentioned on the list, Lord, Marilyn and her upcoming uh, EKG, Lord, Gabriel and his, his biopsy results. Lord, we just we pray for those and we pray for your hand upon them. Lord, we pray that, that you would be with the doctors and give them the wisdom and the guidance. And Lord, just, uh, just to heal their bodies. Lord, however that, whatever form that takes, Lord, because we know you're still in the healing business. And so, Lord, we do thank you for that today. And it's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He would give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. Mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold. 
So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. We're going to be looking at first eight or nine verses here in, in chapter 3 this morning after we looked at the end of chapter 2 last week. And as I was reading through this this week, one of the things that I, I thought about is when I was a kid, Spent a lot of time over at my grandmother and grandpa's house. Uh, they lived across the street from us, and, and so we, we spent a lot of time over there. And I remember my grandmother, if we weren't watching the Atlanta Braves play baseball on TV, because in my house, in their house, if you didn't watch the Tar Heels and you didn't watch, you know, and then they get beat yesterday by state, but that's, that's, that's another sore subject. Um, but you watch the Tar Heels, you watch the Braves. You watch the Redskins, and if you wasn't watching one of those, then she usually had on TV, she loved to watch Perry Mason. I know I'm dating myself a little bit here. She loved to watch Perry Mason. She loved to watch uh, Matlock. She loved to watch uh, Andy Griffith, those kind of things. But I was thinking about uh, the, the show Matlock, and, you know, he was a defense attorney, on that show, and so he would always figure out a way to defend his clients. And usually sometime throughout the trial that they were having, he would always stand up in that gotcha moment when the prosecutor was making his case, and he'd say, I object. And they said, well, what do you mean you object? And it either, you know, he'd either say, no, sit back down, or, you know, but he always had that little ace in his pocket that he was ready to play to be able to get his clients off because he knew the truth. Well, in chapter 3, Paul is kind of playing both sides of this. Paul has presented an argument in chapter 2. The end of chapter 2, Paul presented uh, this argument. And then, well, as a matter of fact, I'll just, I'll just read you what he said in chapter 2 here. He says, For circumcision is indeed a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. And so if a man who is circumcised, uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn those who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter, and his praise is not for man, but of God." And so Paul presented that to the Jews last week. And not only did he present that, but this week he said, you know what? I know what they're going to stand up and say. I know they're going to stand up and say, Paul, I object to this line of, of thinking that you've presented today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to object. And so Paul's like, I know that's what's going to happen. I know they're already going to object to this. I already know the arguments that they're going to present to try to make me think that I'm wrong here. And so he's writing this to the Roman church that, is, is, that has Jews, that also has Gentiles in it. And he's going to say, Yo, you know what, I'm going to just go ahead and answer the objections right off the bat. I'm going to tell you what you're going to object to, and then I'm going to give you the truth. And so that is what Paul is going to do. He's going to meet the objections of the Roman church here, the Jews that are in the Roman church. He's going to lead them into the truth. And so what, we're, what I want to do is I want to look at four different arguments that they present in this passage here. They present four different arguments, and we're going to look at those arguments. And then at the end, we're going to take a look at how we apply this because the problem is he's writing this to the Jews. 
He's not writing this to Gentile believers. And so we cannot take this and apply it just step for step because we're not Jews. And so it's, it's one of those where we have to take the principles out of it and then build on the principles to apply it to our life. So we'll do that at the end, but I want to just kind of explain this to you. Now, you can, you can raise your you can feel free to raise your hand. But any of you have read Romans or any other writing of Paul, and you have maybe read through something and you get to the end of it and you look back on it and you go, huh? And maybe you read it two or three times sometimes and you think, man, what is he talking about? That's chapter three, <laughs> okay? That's chapter three for me. Um, Martin, Lord jo Martin Lloyd Jones was talking about this when he said that Romans chapter 3 is not only one of the most difficult chapters in all of Romans, it is actually one of the most difficult chapters in all of Scripture. Basically, um, I'm paraphrasing him, when you study Romans chapter 3, he's basically saying good luck. It's difficult, right? So we're going to do the best we can to kind of get through this this morning, uh, understanding. Um, and, and so... I don't feel so bad when I, when I read something like that with, with Paul and, and you think to yourself, wait a minute, what is he talking about? Because Peter, Peter even said himself that some of the writings of Paul are hard to understand. That came from Peter. And so if, if Peter was having trouble with Paul, then I don't feel so bad if I have a little bit of trouble with it too. And so um, hopefully what we'll do is we're going to take this and we're going to break it down and make it as simple as we possibly can so that we can understand it and then turn around and reapply it uh, to our life. And so let's read first from chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone a liar, as it is written, though you may be justified in your words and prevail when you were judged. But if our righteousness serves to show, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge, charge us with saying their condemnation is just? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, if that's the first time you've ever heard that, you might be thinking like I did. Huh? What is Paul talking about? Well, we're going to look at it. And the first one is advantage. So Paul is anticipating the arguments that, that has been made, you know, that would be made by the Jews. And probably Paul had had these arguments brought to him before. You know, because it was Paul's custom to go into the synagogues first and reason with the Jews before he would go into uh, the Gentiles and talk to them. And so in his, in his reasoning with the Jews in the synagogues and presenting the gospel message of Jesus Christ to them, he probably had been met with these objections, and it probably wasn't one time. And so he's like, I'm going to go ahead and preemptively, as I write this letter to the Romans, the Holy Spirit led him to preemptively write these objections down and answer them so that when he got there, because he had hoped to come to Rome and, and meet them personally, when he got there, he wouldn't have to go through this with them. Again, they would already have his answers. So this is what he says. Basically, the Jew is saying, look, if you told us last week that circumcision, that, that outward sign of the covenant is of no value, it is really of no value to us, then you are taking advantage, you're taking away all the advantages we had in the Old Testament. You're taking away the covenant promises. You're taking away Moses. You're taking away Abraham. As a matter of fact, you're taking away the whole entire Old Testament to us. And so what then advantage does the Jew actually have? Because you've just pretty much wiped out our whole heritage. Well, Paul said... You have a great advantage. He said, first of all, and I find this interesting, that Paul said, first of all, but then he never gives a second or third reason. 
He just says, first of all, and then he stops with, you have the word of God. That you were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's a really good advantage that they had. You see, God had entrusted them with the law. He had entrusted them with the prophets. He had entrusted them with, with the Proverbs and the Psalms. He had trusted them with the entirety of the Old Testament. They had that with them. The other nations that were surrounding them did not have access to that like they did. And so they were entrusted with the Word of God, and that was their great advantage. It was a great privilege to have the light of God and His Word in their life. But also, to have that privilege also came responsibility. They had the privilege of, of the Word of God, but they were also then expected to be responsible to the Word of God. Not only to just read it and study it and preserve it and pass it on, but they were also to live it out every day. You see, now we talk about the gospel message, and, and the gospel message that we find in the New Testament is go and tell, right? We're told to go into all the world, make disciples. But see, in the Old Testament, it was supposed to be that the Jewish nation was so separated apart from, from the world that it was the come and see. That people were to come and they were to see how different they were because they adhered to the Word of God and how their nation was so dedicated to following God that they were totally different. But see, the problem is they had the promises of God, but they didn't believe them. They didn't believe them. Because what is the one central promise that is in the covenant with, or the, the actual the covenant with, with Abraham, a blessing to the entire world? The covenant, the law covenant pointed to Jesus Christ, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with David, the, the, the promise of, of the one who would, would crush the, the head of the serpent in, in Genesis, the proto-evangelicum. All of those things, they were promises in the Old Testament, but what did those promises point to? They promised, pointed to someone who was to come. The Messiah who was, was supposed to come and he would save the entire world from their sin and it would come out of the Jewish lineage. They were supposed to be ready and willing and able to accept the one who was to come. But unfortunately, what did they do? As we move toward Easter here in the next couple of weeks, we see the, the, the Easter theme that the world rejected Jesus Christ. And the Jews, they had the word of God. They were supposed to be looking for him. But they didn't believe it. And so that responsibility that they had to believe the gospel, that privilege that they were given in having the Word of God actually is their condemnation because they had it. They knew it. They were supposed to be looking for it, and yet when it showed up, they didn't believe it. And so that responsibility turned into their judgments. Not only were they, did they have an advantage, but they were ambivalent. They were ambivalent because here's what Paul is, is basically saying here. He says, but if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. That's kind of paraphrasing what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that, hey, just because you don't believe does not mean God is not faithful. He says, as a matter of fact, it is the exact opposite that even if the whole world did not believe, if not one single person in history ever believed the message that God sent, would that make God unfaithful to his word? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, if you see it on the screen there, I want you to write that down. I want you to understand this. When it comes to an issue between us and God, the problem never lies in God. If there is an issue that we have between us and God, guess where the problem always ends up? The problem is with us. It is not with God because God is perfect. God is faithful. God is just. He is, that's part of who he is. 
You see, what does the Bible say about God? Is God someone who can just willingly tell us a lie anytime he wants to? No, matter of fact, it says what? He cannot lie. That's one of the things that God cannot do. We talk about things, all the things that God can do, but there's something that God cannot do, and that is lie. Why can he not lie? Because if God was unfaithful or untruthful, then he would not be God any longer. Because there would be some imperfection found in him and he could not be God. And so to make God God, he has to be completely faithful and he has to be completely just. And so if there's a discrepancy between man and God, the discrepancy always lies within man. That's what the Jews are talking about here. Wait a minute. God said that he was going to deal with the Jews and we were his chosen people. And then and, and Paul goes in in chapters 9 through 11. We'll get into that here in a few months. We're not going to get into that today. But he goes into that in more detail in chapters 9 through 11 where he returns back to the Jewish nation. He talks about how God's not done with them yet. But just because they had rejected God did not make God unfaithful to his promise. It made man unfaithful to God. That's how that works. And he said, so y'all have been ambivalent to the message that God has entrusted you with. You've acted like it didn't really matter because he promised you a Savior. The Savior came and told you who he was. He proved it by his miracles, by his death, by his resurrection. He proved to you who he was. But you still decided that you didn't want any part of it because he didn't fit your mold. He didn't fit what you think the Messiah should look like. He didn't come and kick Rome out of the promised land. He didn't come and overthrow the Roman government and set himself up as king. He didn't do those things like you thought he should. And so you rejected him out of hand because he didn't meet your expectations. He's like, but he came and met the expectations that God had set for him. God was completely faithful to his promise even though you were unfaithful in your belief. Then he said, okay. They said, all right. Let me give you the third argument. He said, but if our sin demonstrates God's righteousness, how can he judge us for it? Paul says, well, that would mean God can't judge anybody. See, here's the thing. Paul is, is, is putting forth the argument that if God's righteousness is, is shining through when, we, when he judges us, then he would be wrong to judge us because we would be instruments of his glory. That's about as clear as mud, isn't it? Let's try to simplify this a little bit more. Basically, if you read back through chapter 2, God, Paul started off with the Gentiles, right? He was telling them about what, how all they had missed the boat. The Jews would have been standing in the background... Going what? Amen. Amen. Get them. You get them, Paul. You're right. Let's go. Hey, get, throw the book at them. Then Paul turns around and says, let me tell you something. That, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You leave us out of this. It's, you were doing fine when you were talking to them. Don't you turn around and start this mess with us. Paul's like, no, you're just as guilty as they are. They're like, no, 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 no. You're telling me that God's righteousness is shown through his judgment when we sin. Paul's like, yep. Well, then he shouldn't judge us. Because if our sin gives him, makes him more glorified, then we're actually doing something good for God by doing bad. See how they get this all twisted? Paul's like, you couldn't be more wrong here. <laughs> He's like, because if God exempts you from judgment... When you sin, then how in the world could he say then that he could judge anybody else? If he can't judge you for your sin, then he can't rightfully judge anybody else for their sin. He can't give you an exception and let, and let you off the hook and let everybody else go because then he would be what? Unjust. And if God is unjust, then God is not God because he's completely justified in condemning people for their sin. 
Paul even said he was amazed here that people would even make this argument. He's like, may it never be. He said, if God can't judge the Jewish nation, then how is he going to judge the world? Nobody gets a special exemption for God judging their sin. God's going to judge the entire world. Whether Jew or Gentile, he's going to judge me, he's going to judge you. And he is right in doing that. Because he is the eternal, perfect God who has set the standard that we all have to meet. And when we fall short of that standard, then he rightly has to judge us for breaking that standard. And who can say that they have ever lived up to that standard? Paul even goes on in Romans chapter 5 and he says what? That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us have ever met the standard that God has set. None of us except Jesus Christ. He's the only one who's ever met that standard. And God sent him to earth for us so that he knew we couldn't meet that standard, but he put Jesus in our place. And he judged him based on our sin. He who knew no sin was made sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, if, if, if God doesn't judge you, then he can't judge anybody else. He has to. Thank God that Jesus Christ came and he saved me. So now when I stand before God, I don't have to hear the condemnation. Because the Bible says, therefore, is, there is now no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. If you're in Jesus Christ, you get to stand before God, not as righteous in yourself, but you get to stand with the righteousness of Christ that is, that is placed over you and in you. And God doesn't see you for your sin. He sees His Son and His righteousness that has canceled out your sin, that has paid for it. But if it's not for Jesus Christ, then we have to stand and give an account for that. And God will condemn the sinner because they haven't taken advantage of the payment that Jesus made on the cross. Paul said, your argument doesn't make sense. And then the fourth thing here is accused. They were accusing Paul of teaching something. Basically what they were, they were accusing Paul of teaching is that his teaching made people sin more. It's like, Paul, if, if you're teaching this stuff... Really what you're teaching is that, that I ought to sin all the more because my sin brings God glory in His judgment. And, and I could imagine Paul the first time he ever run across this objection. I saw a meme the other day. And the meme had this little girl and she was squinting her eyes like this. And at the top of the meme, it said, have you ever met somebody so stupid that it makes you look like that? I could imagine Paul doing the same thing to those who were accusing him of this. That he's squinting his eyes like, how dumb can one person be to make this argument? Like, y'all have missed the boat completely here. That you're accusing Paul, Paul saying, you're accusing me of causing you to sin more? Like, come on now. Doesn't make any sense. But that's what they were saying. That's what they were saying. As a matter of fact, what they really have done is they knew they were bested in the argument. They have been bested in the argument. There wasn't, there wasn't anywhere else they can go, but they were not willing to concede the point. So basically what they did in this fourth argument is they just rephrased the first argument to make it sound different, but they're essentially saying the same thing. That you're causing me to sin by what you're teaching. Or you're telling me at least I ought to sin more. So that God gets more glory. And Paul's like, no. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, he changes to the first person here. He had been talking, you know, to the Jews. But he's like, no, I want you to take me for an example. He's like, if what I'm telling you, if, what I'm telling you is a lie. Paul's like, if I'm lying, should God judge me? Because my lie made you sin and brought him more glory? 
He's like, you see how that don't make any sense? He's like, if I'm lying, if I'm lying, then does God have a right to judge me for telling you something false from his word? They would have all said, yeah, he does. He should judge you for lying to us. Paul's like, okay, how's that any different from you then lying about your actions before God and saying you're innocent here and doing all these things? I could probably see them just kind of shrink their shoulders like, uh-oh, where'd I go from here? He's just taken every argument that I've made and he's destroyed it by just asking simple questions. Paul's like, but if, if, if what I'm saying, what you're saying is true, then why, would God, why should God judge me as a liar? Why should God judge me as a liar? If he's going to give you an exemption, I should be exempt too. See, it goes back. They just kept trying to recircle the, the wagons here. Paul's like, then why is people talking bad about me? Why are they slandering me? I mean, shouldn't the end justify the means here? If I'm lying, God gets the glory, then we're all good. But that's not how it works. Paul said their condemnation is just. As a matter of fact, what he's saying is just because you made that argument, just because you would willingly go to those levels to try to prove that you shouldn't be judged proves the fact that God is just in judging you because they're trying to excuse their actions before God. That is what they were trying to do here. And he's like, no, this is absurd. And it just proves my point all the more that God is just in condemning those who do these things. So, that's the four arguments. I hope that is clear as mud. Those are not easy arguments to kind of get through. We've kind of done the best we could to, to paraphrase what Paul's saying, put it maybe as simply as, as we possibly can. But here is the, the main thing. This is the so what, because eventually we have to get to that, right? We have to get to that, the so what of the, the, the argument. The so how do we apply this to our life, because it doesn't do any good just to read this and, and try to break down the arguments if we can't take something from them and apply them back to what we live. And so I think we can apply these passages in, in, in the following four ways. The first one is accountability. They were given spiritual privileges. Spiritual privileges increase your responsibility. Think about it like this. Israel was given amazing privileges. They had the very words of God. They were responsible for the word of God to follow it, but they didn't. We here in this church today, we have spiritual privileges. Not only do we have the Old Testament like they had, Guess what we now have? We have the privilege of having the New Testament written. They didn't have that. I mean, matter of fact, when Paul was, was writing this, they, that, this was part of the New Testament being formed. They didn't have all that yet. We do. We have access to the Word of God 24 hours, 7 days a week. We can read more about the Word of God. We can, we can study the ancient writers and we can see all the commentaries and we can take the, 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 the language experts and we, can, and we can look at Greek words and we can interpret those. I mean, we have more privileges today than at any time in history. We have more access to all the things that increase our knowledge of the Bible. But with that, we also have more responsibility. We can't have the excuse that, well, we didn't know. We didn't know. We can't plead ignorance. If you, were, if you grew up in a Christian home, you had parents that took you to church, that studied the Word of God with you, that read the Word of God, that taught you at home, guess what? You have a great spiritual privilege. There's not a lot of people that have that in their life. If you did, you had a great spiritual privilege. If you go to a church and you've been a part of a church where the Bible is preached unashamedly, the good stuff, the hard stuff, and everything in between, you got a spiritual privilege. 
If you have a church to where the leaders are following God's word and they're trying to, to live it out and make sure that the church is functioning the way that it's supposed to be, you have a great spiritual privilege. You see, there's a lot of churches out there today and they don't follow the word of God. As a matter of fact, when Carla and I were dating, we were dating, I went up to Western Carolina University to visit her for the weekend. She had some thing that she needed, she wanted a date for, you know, and we were supposed to dress up and go to this thing Sunday. We decided to go to church Sunday morning, and we went to this little church on campus. And we went into the church, and I mean, it was, it was a beautiful church, really nice. The people were really friendly. And the pastor got up, and he began to, to begin his sermon. And the sermon went on for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. There was no scripture read. There was no mention of Jesus. There was no mention of God or repentance or salvation or anything that had to do with anything in the Word of God. Basically, he got up and recited Fox News and CNN and all of these things for the first 15 or 20 minutes. And you could tell just by listening to it that it wasn't going anywhere else other than that. That's where the sermon was going to go that day. The Bible was never opened in that sermon. And so Carla and I got up and left. And we walked out the back. I said, come on, let's go. She said, why? I'm like, because this is not a church. She said, what do you mean? I said, they're not going to study the Word of God. See, we have a responsibility. Not only are we given spiritual advantages, but then... We have the responsibility to study it, live it out, and proclaim it. The second one is apply. Kind of goes along with the advantage, right? Once we understand the advantages we have, then we have the responsibility to actually apply it to our life each and every day. That's what we should do. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he applies the point this way. He says, so... The point, therefore, at which you and I start is this. We say that this is no ordinary book, this is the Word of God. And do we show that we realize that and what a privilege it is by reading it, studying, delving into it, spending time praying over it? He says that we shouldn't just quickly read over a few verses in the morning before rushing off to important things. Rather, we should say, here is God speaking to me. And we should want to listen to what God has to say. So, we have the Word of God. It is to our advantage. It's to our responsibility then to study it, understand it, put it to work in our life every day. The third one here is the approach. Once we understand what the Bible has to say, once we read it and we study it, you have two choices. You can either believe it and accept it, or you can argue with God about it. Well, God, this is not what I want to hear. I don't like what you had to say right there. There's a lot of times I read it, I don't like it. You know why? Because it's calling me out on something in my life that I need to change. That's what God's Word does. It convicts us. It should convict us. If we can read the Word of God and we can walk out from reading the Word of God and it has no impart or impact on our heart, what does that say about us? Because God's Word is not dead. It's living. It's active. It pierces even to the bone and the marrow, sharper than any two-edged sword. We can go on and on and on about what the Word of God is, but... If you can read the Word of God and then you can say, you know what, God, I want to actually argue with you about this point because I don't like it. You go right ahead. You argue to your heart's content. I'm going to give you the end of the argument. You're going to lose. If you want to argue with God, I promise you're going to lose. Y'all remember... Uh, Somebody who wanted to argue with God a little bit? Y'all remember Job? Didn't he want to argue with God just a little bit? 
God said, all right, you want to argue? I'm going to question you and you're going to answer. And what did Job ultimately realize? He wasn't going to win that argument. So when we come to the part of Scripture to where we think, you know what, I got a problem with this and I want to take it up with God, we probably need to understand how Job responded to arguing with God. Eventually, Job put his hand over his mouth and he says, you know what, I might want to shut up here. I probably don't want to say any more. Because really I understand where I, the insignificance that I have in relation to where God is. That I'm not that powerful to be answering God. But then he went a little further. Not only did he just be quiet, but he actually repented in dust and ashes. He said, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have been arguing with you. You see, that's how we have to approach God. We approach him in submission and obedience, not in, not in argumentative tones, because we're not going to win. And then finally, the last one here is the answer. What was happening here at the end is that the Jews were making excuses for their sin. They didn't take the word of God and let it convict them and lead them to repentance. They were just clinging on to any excuse that they could find that would rationalize their sin. I think I've said this to you before. If not, maybe you've heard, you'll hear it for the first time this morning. But when we try to rationalize something in our life, guess what we're usually trying to rationalize? Something that's wrong. Because right never needs rationalizing. If you're doing what is right, you don't need a reason. You do it because it's right. But when we start trying to make excuses, well, you know, I was, I was kind of thinking, that, yeah, usually we can probably look at it and say that wasn't right. That we were doing the wrong thing and now we're trying to come up with a reason why we were doing it. That's what they were doing here. And so for us, we have to make sure that when we start doing these things, when we read the Word of God, we study the Word of God, we submit to the Word of God in our life, that we don't come up with a bunch of excuses to disregard our sin. We have to allow the Word of God to convict us and lead us to repentance. Because when we get to the Word of God, I think it was Stephen Cole who said it this way. He says, Make sure that you have repented of your sin and take refuge in the Lamb who was slain for sinners. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is God's final answer to every objection that humans have ever conceived. There it is. The Word of God should point us to Jesus Christ. And anything that we try to object to is our fleshly way of trying to say, no, that's not what it is. Jesus Christ is the only answer that any of us can ever, he's the right answer. You want to take the final exam and you want to get it right? The answer is always Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you for your word. Lord, how it is alive and active, Lord, that it, that it speaks to us, it convicts us. Lord, that it, that it moves us. Lord, help us not to just take it for granted. Lord, that we just read it and pass on through. But Lord, help us to, to, to hear you speak to us through it. Lord, as the Holy Spirit works in our life to, to make us more like Christ, help us to take your word and apply it. Lord, understanding that you are the judge of all the world. Lord, and that you are just. And there's no objection, Lord, that nullifies your word. Lord, help us to, to see Jesus in your word through every part. Lord, help us to also submit to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if there's somebody here that hasn't done that today, Lord, Lord, I just ask that you draw them because the Bible says no one comes to the Father unless he draws them. So, Lord, draw them to yourself this morning that they would, they would accept your Son by faith. Lord, give their life to him forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to sing our uh, hymn of invitation. We're going to sing verses 1 and 5 of I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. So won't y'all stand? I will sing the wondrous story.
Crystal sea. 